We are here with Rodney Adams, who studies Aboriginal Sign Languages, and our interpreter is Sarah Dearlove. Hello, Rodney, and hello, Sarah. Hi, g'day. How are you? Lovely to be here this morning. I'm looking forward to this little chat, be able to share some stories about Indigenous Sign Languages. Excellent. When we think of sign languages in Australia, we usually think of Auslan, which has its roots in English. And many people are surprised to find that there are Aboriginal signed languages. Where do they come from? What's their history? Well, really, Auslan is um, arrived in Australia roughly 200 years ago, um, you know, 18, early 1800s. So it was, um, its origins are in BSL, which is British Signed Language. So, you know, with so much British history, um, deaf communities moved from Britain to Australia and, you know, more and more people moved to Australia and the language changed, developed and grew. Auslan is only incredibly young language in that instance. Um, it's been sort of established around the same time as colonial settlement. Now, what we do know is, and there's been a quite a bit of research by myself and other colleagues of mine, that have actually found that Australian Indigenous languages have existed for such a very long time, for thousands and thousands of years. Now, if we were, um, you know, just as we have Indigenous spoken languages, for everyone there is an Indigenous signed language. So there's some research being undertaken that's really starting to explore these ideas of, of finding them. Um, these small clusters of Aboriginal people um, that are still continuing to use these languages. We're also looking at dialect differences that will exist. So not only language differences, but dialect differences. So it's a huge area of study. Um, and what we're actually finding is that the Yolngu signed language, um, which we're now hoping to be able to publish um, a book very, very soon in that area, shows that signed languages, Indigenous signed languages, have been around for such a long time and they're certainly much older than Auslan. How many Indigenous sign languages are we talking about here? Oh, that's a huge question. Um, and, <laughs> you know, first we need to determine the number of Indigenous spoken languages for certain. And what we know is that the research shows different numbers. Some sort of estimate 250, some estimate it's well over 400. So I would expect that signed languages, in, you know, would sort of have been thousands of them once upon a time. but. How many are still existing today? We're yet to determine. Again, I've been in contact with you know, a number of different people. I presented a paper recently at another Indigenous Sign Languages conference, and from that I've established a lot of contacts. So there's certainly some information out there. What we need to do is sort of you know, collate it, collaborate, and then work together for the revitalizations, which is gonna be really exciting to see. I wanted to ask, um, I've heard and I don't know much about it, but I know that there are some places in Australia where gestures or signs are used by uh, hearing people um, and that that might also interact with the development of, of sign languages for deaf people in those places. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Um, yes. Certainly, so there are some areas, again, some areas of research. What you're referring to is called hand talk. Um, and people assume that when we're speaking of hand talk, that it is just gestures, but it is essentially the foundations of sign language. So yes, they're gestures, but when we add to that the phonology and the syntax of languages and the other characteristics that make any language a language, then what we actually have is something, you know, that becomes sign language. It becomes meaningful. The brain detects patterns of language and it allows the brain to actually develop it. Gestures, on the other hand, can be used in isolation or they can be used in combination with signed language vocab. Then we can add grammatical structure and then that's what we actually see as language development. There are parts of the east coast of Australia um, and there are certain little pockets um, where we're seeing the use of sign language re-emerging. A colleague of mine who's in Canberra, her name is Lauren Reid, um, and she's done some research into um, looking at signed languages and assumptions that, you know, some of these languages have effectively died out or disappeared, but they are still being used. What we need to do is meet these communities and film them before people pass away and take language with them. It sounds like 
signed languages are having this it sounds like indigenous sign languages are having some of the same issues that indigenous spoken languages are. Yes, yes. Um, and it's, ex yeah, case in point. So at the moment, what we're actually doing is trying to get some funding grants, which will allow us opportunities to video and record in other ways, um, you know, the use of language to engage with indigenous communities. Um, allow um, a rapport to be built, which will develop trust and then allow filming to occur. Um, there certainly are some issues that affect Indigenous sign languages that are common with those of Indigenous spoken languages. Um, and it's about collating as much information as you can. Um, and I'd love to see, you know, the use of Indigenous sign languages by Indigenous deaf populations in Australia. Um, recently, um, in the Deaf Yolngu community, there was a filmmaker who won an award um, and who is a Yolngu Sign Language um, user themselves, um, but looking at, you know, the, the importance, the significance of sort of preserving these languages, um, developing relationships. He spoke about the importance of developing relationships, um, you know, particularly when you're sort of working with isolated communities. I'm thinking of an example in Port Hedley in WA. I've recently been had someone get in touch with me and they're looking at sort of researching, recording and sort of keeping for longevity these languages. There's certainly a lot going on. I'm also aware of some stuff going on in Mary Wong, um, which is down sort of in WA again. Um, and then we've got uh, Gaja, Gija language. Look, there are plenty of them out there, but because the focus has been so much upon the use of Indigenous spoken languages, it means that sign languages have been forgotten or pushed to the side, which is why I want to ensure that we've sort of got that nice balance between the use of all of the languages, because this is the year of Indigenous language, and that has to include the use of Indigenous signed languages as well. Um, I was wondering, um, I did my undergrad in linguistics at a department that was shared between spoken linguistics and sign linguistics in Stockholm. Uh, and it meant that we got to learn some basic Swedish sign, which is uh, great fun. Uh, but, um, and I learned that there can be some differences in um, how sign languages use if they use a lot of signs with two hands or if they use a lot of signs with one hand. So um, Swedish sign uh, and American sign differ a bit in that. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, differences between different Indigenous Australian signs in their sign characteristics. Um, I think probably one of the more important points is to clarify that when we're talking about Indigenous signed languages, they're natural. In, and by that I mean that they're not reliant upon spoken language influence. So, in, for example, in Auslan, there is a lot of finger spelling that exists, but that's where we're using English terminology. And in Australia, we use two hands to create the alphabet. However, in the past, Indigenous sign languages, you know, they would have signs that were relevant um, or different words um, for different, you know, use of language, but there was no finger spelling method. So Indigenous sign languages would be more visual representations of the world around us as opposed to you know, a spoken language or an alphabetical formula that exists in other spoken languages. So in the instance of American sign language, British sign language, French sign language, and here in Australia with Auslan, we see huge influence of the spoken language, the dominant language in a country, influencing the signed languages. But again, like any language, whether it be spoken or signed, there's diversity of users um, and there's also diversity of dialect. And where we have a spoken language, we'll always have a signed language. Do you think that you could show us some uh, differences between different Indigenous signed languages and maybe even between Auslan and those languages? Mm. Uh, I might be a wee bit rude because there's only a couple of rude ones that I actually remember, so I'm uh, okay. I'm unsure how to proceed. We like okay, the rude so ones. We're all about the rude ones. <laughs> okay, so I know, for example, in plain Indian Sign Language, um, northern United States, the North Americas, um, some of their stuff is just absolutely incredible. So they've done some really great research there. And they made a comparison between ASL, which is American Sign Language, and Plain Indian Sign Language for a number of different words. 
One sign that they use in plain Indian sign language for father is this. This is father. Oh. Okay, mm -hmm. you with me? Now, yes. the use, this is son, as in the father's son. Yes? Got it. You with me? Yeah. So, We're there. there are other examples, you know, certainly here in Australia, a young woman is referred to like this, and an older woman is referred to like this. So, signs like that um, certainly make sense. They're certainly easier to remember because they're so very obvious, as opposed to some of the, you know, European sign languages, um, you know, and Auslan is one of those, ASL, American Sign Language being another, because they've essentially been borrowed from European sign languages. So, in Europe, different sign languages exist, but they're certainly more arbitrary. The individual vocab is arbitrary. There's no direct correlation between what you're seeing and the symbol that's being used to represent, or the word in this instance. But when we find um, some research that shows that Indigenous sign languages um, and the intelligence and the richness of, of language, it makes incredible sense. They're incredibly iconic, which makes them easy to remember. So just like those examples I showed you just now, I think it's brilliant. Mm. That's really cool. And yet um, we, we, we notice that a lot of people have this misconception that signed languages are just iconic. If you want to say a thing, that sign will look like the thing. And that's not always true, but it sounds like it's true a lot. Well, um, it's a natural reflection of the use of signed language. So when we sign, we're trying to sort of make reference to, you know, something visual that we see or experience in the world. Um, some of the kinship signs um, in relation to Indigenous families and family history are, you know, very different when they're compared to Europe-centric signed languages like Auslan. So an example that I particularly love here is an Aboriginal sign language um, you know, referring to family, like this. So the hand is placed on the spine and that is reference to grandmother. That sign is so different because what we have as sign language users is a signing space. And in European centric mm. sign languages, that's in front of us. Indigenous sign languages allow us to you refer to the back of us. So grandmother on the fine, on the spine, because grandmother is backbone of community. So that's incredibly significant and it's an incredibly significant sign that genu genuinely reflects cultural reference to grandmother. Um, mm. So yeah, I think it's beautiful. Um, another cool thing that um, I have some friends who, who do more sign language um, and uh, there are some uh, great um, benefits to signing that you can't do when you speak. For example, when you speak, you can't say two things at the same time, but when you sign a narrative, you could possibly have two agents or a narrative. You could you could have more things going on at once simultaneously um, in a way that unless you have some sort of polyphonic <laughs> ability to do two tones at the same time with your mouth, you can. Um, and I was wondering if that was a practice that people use also in um, Australian sign, the sort of I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about like the, the, uh, how do you say the the differences between sign and spoken that open up more opportunities like this, like the sign space. Okay, probably the major difference that exists between spoken and sign languages is. Oh. Okay, so as far as sign languages goes, they're certainly more flexible. Um, and what we can incorporate into one, one sign can convey an entire sentence of meaning in the English language. So like Indigenous spoken languages, they'll often have one word that can convey an entire concept. So in reference to some of those differences, okay. So certainly there are grammatical differences that exist between spoken and sign languages. So for Auslan itself, we're certainly much more flexible in word order we can play around with it a little bit more. Um, we can maintain meaning. Um, we use what are referred to as the non-manual features of Auslan, which is essentially the facial expression. So those facial expressions, those non-manual features are essentially a reflection of the intonation that speakers use when they play around with their voice. Um, so we use facial expression to convey tone, which can also add so much more meaning to words themselves. 
Uh, when you are a sign language user, you can certainly be incredibly subtle with your facial expressions. And again, you can change the meaning that hearing people in the room may not catch. Um, but, you know, some deaf people, you know, often don't understand, you know, some of those intonations that exist. Um, sometimes, you know, you can use your voice to, you know, sort of reflect a slight bit of sarcasm, um, you know, and we as deaf people, that's lost to us. However, we can use those same things with a slight adjustment of the eyebrows to suggest that we're being incredibly sarcastic and other hearing people in the room won't know what we're talking <laughs> about. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I am just wondering about what would be an example of a sign that conveys multiple concepts in a way that maybe spoken English or even Auslan don't. Mm. We're, ask we're asking you for a lot of complicated things. So this I'm is really the curious. sign for none of your business. <laughs> none of your business. Okay. That's a good sign to know. None of your business. Is yeah. there, do you have a sense of how that sign, so what, what I'm seeing is to, my hand is in a two-fingered shape. I'm pointing to my nose, and then I'm turning my hand around and using that same shape directed towards somebody else. Is that because I feel, this is just a guess as to how this symbol got to be that way, is it because that person wants me to not stick my nose in their business? Is that what's going on there? Oh, oh, that would be really difficult to say for sure because a lot of signs are essentially, as I said before, arbitrary. There's not necessarily a direct correlation between what you see um, and what's actually, you know, and what it means. I don't know the precise history of that sign, so I couldn't say with any certainty. But it's certainly, you know, some yeah. of the wonderful things about researching languages generally and asking, you know, why people use the vocabulary that they do. Um, you know, there are some signs that you sort of look at and think, gosh, who knows where that came from or why it came to be that particular <laughs> sign. But um, yeah, it's a really question to answer. I wouldn't like to answer it with any real certainty. Well, now I'm, I'm really, I understand that, but now I'm really curious. When we are looking for the etymology of words, the word histories of spoken English, we can look in books from long ago and see where the first instance of a word came from. And we can make some guesses about how words in spoken English got to be that way or in written English. If you want to find out the etymology, the word history for a sign, where do you go? That beats me. So um, <laughs> it's actually a really valuable question, though, because very recently a deaf person from the United States was doing some research um, and looking at, you know, this world of science and new terminology that exists. Um, but there are no signs for these new terminologies. So whether it be the world of science or technology, this individual researcher sort of looked at and met with a number of deaf people and what they actually did is created a, a new vocab list of around a thousand signs that allowed them to sort of match new terms that exist in the English language that make reference to science and technology. So it's certainly a field of academic study that allows, you know, um, vocabularies of all languages to change and develop over time. Um, but it sort of requires the use of, um, you know, rather than having an interpreter finger spell an English word every single time it comes up, you know, just like spoken language, you know, the dynamics of language, whether they be spoken or signed, are always evolving and changing. They have to to keep up with the times. And that's actually a really significant point because some Indigenous sound languages we do know have been lost. However, if we can engage with meaning of language within Aboriginal cultures, and then as signs they can be conventionalised, then we can go on to use them and preserve them and redevelop the use of sign, Indigenous sign languages again. Already, you know, on top of what we already know exists. Is there, um, is there a moment, so I know that the, uh, there are many different sign languages in, in Australia and maybe as many as, maybe it's the same question as how many spoken there are. Um, is there, um, naturally or intentionally, are there any sort of signs of people amalgamating um, to to sort of um, join different sign languages? 
is that a process that's happening or is that not the case? Amalgamating with what? With each other, like um, sort of making, um, merging, making sort of contact sign languages that are, are shared across groups that used to have distinct languages. Mm. Essentially, the answer would be it makes sense to try to avoid that because what we then do is sort of recolonize language. So what would happen in that regard is the weaker language would be taken over by the dominant language. So mm. we know that that's what happened, you know, here in Australia, Auslan, you know, arrived and Indigenous Sign Languages died out. The same thing's happening in Samoa, in Fiji. It's happening worldwide. Mm. Um, you know, and in those instances where we've got interpreters that travel to different parts of the world and work with children in developing countries, they bring their language with them but what's important is the preservation of the home language um, to mm. encourage it to remain a dominant language because it fits appropriately with their culture rather than borrowing too much and amalgamating. Mm. Um, we do know that that happens here in Australia. We're now seeing a lot of signs that are very American um, and American sign language has become rather a dominant sign language worldwide, which is something mm. that we'd rather not see that happen mm -hmm. um, because it's about preservation of a number of different languages that exist in different mm. parts of the world. Um, so, and it's about sort of conventionalising signs locally that fit with mm. the context of where you are in this instance, Australia. Mm -mm -mm. I want to ask a little bit about Indigenous signs and how they get new words, because this is a challenge for indigenous spoken languages, maybe they don't have a word for things for scientific terms. Is there a process of lexical creation for these languages? Well, I think one of the sort of more important areas here, so a colleague of mine whose name is Jackie Troy, who's working with other indigenous communities to try and to establish uh, dual naming of places. So particularly here in New South Wales, um, so in New South Wales, we've got the Indigenous Languages Act, um, which means that we've got government support in this particular area. So it's about not being rid of the English word, but adding the Indigenous word that you know existed before to make reference to this place. So we're seeing some examples. So for example, in Sydney, you know, the word Sydney, the sign is this because it makes reference to the Harbour Bridge, but the Harbour Bridge itself is only very new. Therefore, the sign is very new. So what, 1937 odd, then, you know, Sydney Harbour Bridge was launched. So the sign itself is less than 100 years old. However, if we go back to, you know, the indigenous word for that place, which is Gadigal, and then we can actually make a visual representation of Gadigal, that's what we need to actually find and discover. So Gadigal comes from the word Gadi, which is the people of the grass tree. The new word for that place is Sydney. But the visual representation of people of the grass you know, tree would be a visual representation of the grass tree. So it's not about getting rid of the word Sydney or the sign Sydney. It's about acknowledging and respecting languages that came before. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. Um, you know, and I think we're going to see more sign languages making a better ref reflection of how the world looked pre-colonisation, pre the Harbour Bridge more like the Gadigal tree, uh, I beg your pardon, the, the people of the grass tree, the Gadigal people. So yeah, that's what I think it's about. I like that. Um, Hedvig, did you have one? I got, I have another one. Oh no, you go ahead. Uh, one of the encouraging trends for Indigenous spoken languages in Australia is that people are returning to their traditional languages. Is this happening with Indigenous Sign Languages? Oh, yes. Um, but it's really only just begun. We're only sort of at the surface level of it all. Very recently, I presented a paper at the Pulama Conference, which was in Darwin, um, an Indigenous language conference, and we spoke about Indigenous Sign Languages there. And there were a number of people that came up to me afterwards who said, I never thought about, you know, Indigenous sign languages. 
um, and it's something that we really do need to be mindful of and respectful of because it's very much a part of Indigenous communities. It was very much about our social and emotional well-being. Um, it's about empowering individuals to sort of develop and redevelop confidence, pride in self. Um, just like deaf and hard of hearing Indigenous people need those same things, that sense of self, that sense of identity through language. So yes, um, but it's only a very new field of area. It's something that people are only just becoming aware of. Um, and it's about sort of engaging with Indigenous deaf and hard of hearing people in the same way that, you know, spoken languages for Indigenous people has sort of helped them to become more confident, um, you know, and get in there and sort of revitalise. We're only at that, I think I may have gone off task with that question. I don't know if I answered your question. I think so. I think so. <laughs> Sorry, may I just add one more thing? Sorry, mm. if it's okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the New South Wales Indigenous Languages Act of 2017, hurrah. Um, I think you know most of Australia is now looking to New South Wales to see what happens in regards to this. I've had a few people saying to me, you know, please, please, please do some research into Indigenous sign languages of New South Wales because it's going to help future projects. Um, it's about mm. deaf and hearing communities sort of being able to explore their own past, um, their, the way ancestors communicated because not all Indigenous communication was verbal. There was a lot of hand talk and gesturing that was, you know, natural um, for, you know, Indigenous communities. Um, and they used these systems. In Canada, only a few months ago, they've approved two different bills there um, in relation to Indigenous Sign Language. One was, forgive me, the Indigenous Canadians Languages Act. Um, and within it, they've actually stated that they will allow some exploration and research into Canadian Sign Language or North American. So that would include the mm. use of plain Indian Sign Languages, um, mm. you know, and other modes of communication that existed. The other bill they've enacted was the Canadian Accessibility Act. Um, so obviously, in regards to deaf and hard of hearing people, they'll fit into this category as well. Um, so it you know, allows another opportunity for people to access in information to not just English, but to Indigenous language. Um, you know, because English has always been the primary language, or well, for such a long time has been the primary. So it's great for us as Australians to be able to see what's going on overseas um, and see similar things going on here in New South Wales. But there is, you know, one little story, if I may, um, now, the Battle of Little Bighorn. Mm. Oh. I've seen this video. Mm. Ah, okay. So uh, a... in the USA yeah. and Canada, um, you know, having lost the Battle of Little Bighorn, um, you know, it was quite a defeat. And most people are familiar with the story, you know, the general cluster having died at that particular battle. But five years after the event, someone was writing, documenting it. And what they actually witnessed was, you know, this two day battle, then the nomination of a chief, a local chief. And his name was Red Horse, Chief Red Horse. So Chief Red Horse was, you know, part of this retelling and he was asked to tell about the battle, the two day battle. There were two things that popped up after he told his story. He told his story in Indigenous Sign Language. And the second thing is, is that he wasn't deaf. He was a hearing man. So why he chose to tell this story in Sign Language, such a significant story about the defeat and why he chose to tell that story in Indigenous Sign Language. Well, we still don't really know the answer to that question. What we do know is that if he was a hearing man and he was able to use sign language, then sign language wasn't a language that was used only by deaf peoples. So that shows just how significant it is. Plain Indian Signed Languages is now being taught in North American and Canadian schools to both hearing and to deaf students because they're recognising the significance of the language as it existed in the past and they're sort of using it as a way of overcoming issues that currently exist, um, you know, particularly in relation to social and emotional wellbeing, sort of, you know, empowering young people through the use of different language. That story had a huge impact on me when I found that out. An American Indian chief hearing, retelling a story about a huge battle in sign language, that's incredibly significant. Um, really, really significant. Um, 
it's, yeah, the event itself is significant, but you know, the, the, the language he chose to retell it. But so many of us don't know it because so many people think that sign language is just for deaf people, but it is in fact a language that can be accessible for all of us. And I've got a colleague of mine who said to sign is human because you know, hearing and deaf people once upon a long ago used signs and gestures of a way of communication. Communication wasn't limited to speech and listening. Um, and it was a way that you know, entire communities could get together despite different uh -huh. languages. Um, they could overcome barriers that existed for, you know, that exist with spoken languages. It was all overcome for different tribes. That's, that's, uh, that's a really good story. And it's um, what I've been told as well. Um, I did some classes actually in, in Canada and uh, we had a, a sign language, uh, a deaf Canadian come and talk to us about indigenous sign languages. And I think you're right, Canada is a very interesting to look at, a place to look at this because they already have a lot of legislation regarding the use of French and English. So they're already sort of a little bit aware of uh, the, the need for certain support for different languages. And they've also brought that to the sign languages. And I um, I saw a video on YouTube that I've been trying to track down again, which was uh, a story retelling of Little Big Bighorn in American Sign and in Plains Indian Sign. I'll see if I can get it for um, our mm. listeners because it's, uh, it's a simultaneous, they're both signing at the same time. So you can see the story. Uh, oh, and it, it's wow. a great way of showing the the differences um, but that's that's something I was wondering if um, you could also talk a little bit about if you wanted to about indigenous Australian signs about the use of uh, hearing people using it as a way of overcoming boundaries or group boundaries and coming together and being able to share stories and narratives and have meetings um, in, in an easier way because the hearing people share um, signs rather than using spoken languages <clears throat> We certainly know, you know, once upon a time when Indigenous people met from different tribes, they would use gestures as a way of overcoming the limitations that exist for spoken language users. Um, but it just sort of makes me think of another story. Uh, Bangaree, um, gentleman who travelled with, uh, with Matthew Flinders um, and helped him to navigate um, Australia, circumnavigate Australia. Um, Bungaree was essentially responsible for each time the ship, um, you know, particularly on the east coast, for example, any time they needed to port for, you know, they'd run out of food or water or other supplies or needed repairs to the ship. Bungaree was essentially responsible for communicating with the local tribe that met them in the area. Um, so there were times where he was using, you know, communication types, you know, gestures and hand talk to overcome the boundaries that existed between spoken language. So things like we're looking for food or water or sort of, you know, clarifying directions and things like that. Um, if, you know, they needed new wood because, you know, the ship needed some repairs, he was able to use a range of different communication systems that overcame the limitations of just using speech. So if you can imagine mm. that, you know, travelling around the entire coast of Australia, using that mode of communication to communicate with everyone, I think what's sad is that those communication systems have been lost to us as a society um, because it's something that, you know, Indigenous communities have used for such a long time and I think it's important that we acknowledge that and bring it back, um, you know, to, to sort of preserve language. It's something that people knew well, so, you know, once upon a long ago and so much of it's been lost or is endangerment of being lost um, and there's so many different reasons to consider it valuable, um, obviously. I sometimes... Just Oh, go ahead. As, as a hearing person, sometimes, um, like I, I go to Germany sometimes and people don't speak English and I speak a little German and I try to communicate with other hearing people with some gestures that I think would be shared across European. It's like I, I'm trying, but a lot of people aren't used to interpreting it. So uh, it's it's such an obvious, effective, good way of overcoming boundaries, but most people aren't used to it, so it usually doesn't succeed, but it's something that, you know, hearing to hearing people still can benefit from. Yeah. For sure. But this is And this I is do, making... I'm sorry, I've got another story that comes to mind. Would you like another story? Yes, please. 
So I do, yeah, I do love a yarn. Um, okay, so my partner was once in Germany um, and there was, you know, she was with a group of Australians. They went to Germany, they were in a cafe and they were all sort of sitting at this table having a look at the menu, which was obviously printed in German. Not, a one, not one of them understood it. So the waitress came round to the table trying to determine what they wanted to order. There was one person who said they would like a cup of tea with just a little bit of milk, but, you know, the German waitress spoke no English and, you know, the Australians had no German, so the communication was going nowhere quickly. Everyone was getting frustrated and a little bit narky. You could hmm. see the German woman was getting incredibly frustrated, you know, trying to convey, I want some milk. So my partner, who's deaf, um, was sort of looking at this conversation, waved for the attention of the German waitress, looked her up and down because she was rather voluptuous, shall we say. And she did this, she gestured this. <laughs> the German waitress got it straight away though. She nicked off to the back of the kitchen and she came back with a yeah. jug, a jug no less, yeah. of milk. Yeah. But I think that absolutely shows how visual communications can overcome those um, barriers that exist for spoken languages. Perfect example, I reckon. I think we need to say for people who might be listening to this uh, that um, Rodney made a gesture. Um, Daniel, do you want to try? The pulling of the teat. <laughs> very <laughs> iconic, very clear. I understand why she got it. Mm. Yes. At which exactly. point the waitress? At which point the waitress had to determine the level of specificity required as to what kind of milk was being yes, requested. Cow milk and not human milk. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, she came with a jug, so it was probably a little bit more than they needed. <laughs> Possibly. Um, uh, now, yeah. Sorry, I just, I just want to go back a second. Many Australian spoken, many Indigenous Australian spoken languages are a little bit mutually intelligible. Do you, can you tell me if the different Indigenous sign languages are also kind of mutually intelligible, or maybe not? Um, I think, you know, with regards to sign languages generally, it's easier to communicate because deaf people are naturally visual communicators. So we're naturally doing this every day when we're meeting with people here in Australia when we're meeting with people, when we go overseas on a holiday. So obviously the languages are incredibly different, but because we're visual communicators, we can overcome the barriers that exist and we can make ourselves more easily understood. Um, whereas, you know, hearing people do tend to be very limited to the spoken language that they speak and it makes things difficult to overcome. I would say generally speaking, that deaf people do incredibly well at that, um, whether it's mm. here locally or whether it's traveling overseas. We're used to making yeah. ourselves understood by people who don't speak our language. Um, so we are better able to overcome those language barriers that exist because we are naturally going to be able to gesture and make ourselves understood quite well. And maybe more flexible and sort of tolerant of variations I, I know a few, very few sign languages and uh, signs in Swedish, and I use them sometimes. And sometimes I use the wrong hand gesture or the wrong direction. But everyone is so nice, and so you know, oh, she probably means this, you know, more flexible. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> what is so? We, you've been telling us a lot about indigenous sign languages, and we're very grateful. But you have an audience. What would you like everyone to know about Australia or about Indigenous Sign Languages? Okay. Really, I think, so, you know, working in the field of deaf education, I meet a lot of deaf Aboriginal people. And I think it's the same, you know, for Aboriginal children. Um, they want to connect and reconnect with history, with their past, um, ancestry, past culture practices, um, traditional ways of communicating. Um, that sort of helps them or empowers them. What we do know is that the benefits of learning language, you know, and if we're looking at Indigenous populations, about, it's about the social and emotional well-being. So at the Pulamar conference that I mentioned earlier in Darwin, everyone spoke about the benefits 
um, you know, and you know how inspiring it can be for individuals to sort of find their own history, their own language. So whether that's for a hearing person or a deaf of hard of hearing person, it's essentially the same story. However, when it comes to deaf and hard of hearing people, languages have been doubly neglected. So I'd like to see you know communities take up the same interest in the revitalisation of sign languages as they have for the revitalisation of spoken languages. I think that's probably the main thing. I'd like people to take mm -hmm. home. I'd like people all over Australia to just take more note, pay a bit more attention. How can people find out more if they would like to? They could get in contact with me via email. Um, I can send you out my email address very soon. Um, but. I think just sort of encouraging people to have a conversation about signed languages, about how valuable they are as communication systems. I think it's, you know, focusing on, you know, when we think about deaf and hard of hearing people, there's such focus on speech and listening. So while these technologies and these methods can have all sorts of benefits, they're not always successful and there will still be limitations. Um, you know, and if we're looking again about Indigenous communities, um, it's about documenting and, you know, preserving language for longevity. What essentially we'd like to have is one day a database that sort of, you know, has access to all of these Indigenous sign languages where we can collate them from mm. all over Australia. Because when we think about Australia and we think about, you know, sign language systems, it's probably one of the oldest, that they'll be the oldest languages in the world and they need to be preserved and we need to make sure mm. that we're reflecting these, these communities. I think we should be taking huge pride in knowing that, you know, um, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people can actually take such benefit from these ancient languages, um, you know, using gestures and signed languages as a mode of communication and knowing that these have existed since Australia first began. So um, we usually on the show have Indigenous Australian Word of the Week and uh, we do that in our uh, audio audio version of the podcast and we'll be preparing this also for um, uh, sharing the video with people. So we've learned a, a few signs. We learned none of your business, which I think, was that Auslan or? That's an Auslan sign, yep. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of the kangaroo signs was this. And then, yeah, kangaroo. There's a few kangaroos. Yep. And then we had the various uh, older women. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was. Uh, uh, yes, I yes. Was... The man, the woman. Uh, that that was some of those were plain Indian sign language as well, though. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering if there was one uh, sign in particular that we could sort of share to our listeners and get them to maybe um, use or share with their friends that you think is a fun one. Just just a one fun one one that we can sort of have in a um, little video snippet and get them to do. Oh, I'm trying to think of something Whoa. that's, oh, 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 okay. I like all the kangaroo ones. I like but... <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> but... I know. So this particular hand shape is internationally understood to mean I love you. Oh, yes. So when we sort of look at the hand shape, what we've got is, you know, it's also used for emu. Not in the same way, but the same hand shape is used for emu. So sometimes people will see that particular hand shape and think it means something. Um, but in this instance, it means something very different again. Um, so yeah, I think that's just interesting that, you know, one hand shape can be used to represent either a concept of loving someone or an animal. Oh, but you put me on the spot. I want to think it's of something okay, very specific. Okay. Is, is this, um, so is this... Uh, I'm sort in of thinking in... about the kinship signs as well. I particularly like, you know, mm -hmm. whether people remember yeah. grandmother. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's grandmother. Uh, is that in a uh, Yolnu sign or...? Yes, yes. Um, other language groups do use that one as well. But again, there'll be all sorts of variations all over Australia. But mm -hmm. um, yeah depending on culture and country um, and connection to, to land and all that sort of a thing. All right, I think that's, that's great. great. We uh, have been having a chat with Rodney Adams, a researcher at the University of Newcastle. Sorry, am I getting that right? Yes, that's right. 
Okay. Uh, so, Rodney Adams, thanks so much for coming on and uh, having a chat with us today. Thank you. Oh, there you go. Uh, Digigura is the local word for thank you, the Gadigal language. You'll have to forgive the interpreter's pronunciation. Thank you. There we go. And thanks very much to you, Sarah Dearlove, for being our interpreter today. Pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs>